Hello, this is John Sifferman, and today I'll be interviewing Charles Staley, who is a strength and conditioning coach based in Arizona, who specializes in providing inspiration and education for older men who are looking to reclaim their health, fitness, and vitality. Charles is in his late 50s, and yet he is leaner than ever, injury-free, and in the best shape of his life. Charles is not only a coach who trains his clients locally and online, but he's also an athlete. He competes at the national and world level in both weightlifting and powerlifting on the Masters circuit, and he holds three world championship titles in the sport of raw powerlifting. A few of his recent bests include a 400-pound squat, a 510-pound deadlift, and a set of 17 chin-ups. Charles is well known around the world of fitness and has appeared on numerous TV and radio shows. He's also written more than a thousand articles for major publications and websites in the industry, many of which I've read since I started following his work back in 2004. And today, Charles and I will be talking training, so let's dive right in. Can we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been training and, and what keeps you busy these days? Yeah, well, um, I have been uh, coaching, um, you know, re so-called regular folks as well as athletes for you know, I guess I guess we're coming up on 30 years now, and um, um, my my sort of entrance. I, I was in uh, upstate, not upstate, but kind of mid-state New York, um, running a YMCA, and was kind of personal training uh, in in the um, in the late 80s. And I, I think I always say this, and I, I can't. I should look this up one of these days, but. I don't even think the word personal trainer was in widespread use at the time. So I never, never knew what to call myself. People were, what are you doing? Like, oh, I teach people how to lift weights. And like, oh, interesting. But um, so, and then um, I actually, through a series of events, uh, ran into Dr. Fred Hatfield, if you're familiar with that name. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. He was one, yeah, he was one of the first guys to ever squat 1,000 pounds. And he, would, he had just started up something called the International Sports Sciences Association, or the ISSA. And uh, he sent me out to California in 1992. And that was kind of my entrance into the whole fitness biz. So for anyone out there who feels they've benefited from my work, you can thank uh, Fred Hatfield for kind of giving me my start. So, yeah, so in, in one form or another, you know, I've been writing and coaching and teaching seminars and all of that kind of stuff. Um, since I was uh, in my late 20s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've read a lot of your articles over the years, ever since I, I first got into uh, fitness early in my career, and you know, I've learned a lot from you and gotten a lot of good ideas from you. And, and so, yeah, like I said before we uh, started the interview, it's really cool that uh, we can chat for a little bit. Um, you so, bet. So, so you've been at this for a long time, and... Um, a good chunk of my audience are uh, men in their 50s and 60s, and so yeah. I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, kind of get a bird's eye view of how you personally have managed to stay fit and strong into your 50s. You know, you're still, you know, you're deadlifting 500 plus pounds and doing really impressive stuff. So, can you give me a summary of your approach to oh, uh, health and fitness? Yeah, well, I think you know. Um, you can either arrive at a good place because you, you did everything right, or you could just kind of get lucky. <laughs> and I think it's probably a, a combination of those two things for me, I, I guess. But um, I, I, um, I mean, I think one of the reasons I'm not a guy who was doing amazing stuff in his 20s and 30s, and now I'm still doing pretty good. I'm actually doing the best I've ever done right now, actually. And um, so, but I'm not bragging. Part of that is I just honestly consider myself kind of a slow learner, at least when it comes to training myself. And um, so that's part of it. It's just taken me a while to figure this stuff out for me. And um, and then the other part of it is, and I, I guess I can give myself credit for this, is that I'm not sort of an adrenaline junkie kind of type A personality. So um, if if I'm in the gym and something hurts, I stop doing it. So I, and and so. In a way, that's maybe why I never deadlifted 600 pounds. <laughs> uh, because if you talk to athletes who are really, really successful, they have a an ability and a willingness to kind of push through pain. Um, and I, I suppose that's kind of what it takes. But um, but I've never been that way. So on the flip side of things, I guess that's why I'm still doing pretty well. You know, I'll be 57 next month, and. Um, 
you know, I'm the strongest I've ever been and I'm the leanest I've ever been. And um, on top of that, I'm, I'm really not injured. I mean, I do have some minor little aches and pains here and there, but nothing to, nothing to really speak of. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's good. I mean, it's, it's nice to feel healthy when you're almost 60 <laughs> uh, in, in any event. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I'd say that's very rare for somebody to be involved in weightlifting so long and still be healthy into your 50s. You know, you don't run across a lot of people like that. And, you know, it sounds like your approach to, you know, staying away from the no pain, no gain type uh, mentality is, has served you well. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just, I don't know. I, um, I, I don't know where that comes from with me, but I just don't like hurting. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I don't know if that's something I could teach <laughs> somebody else or not, but, uh, I enjoy like not being in pain. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense. So, all right. Um, so what are, what would you say are some of the keys to functional fitness that you think most people gloss over? Well, in a way, this is not going to be earth-shaking, but I, I really have an emphasis in my thinking and in my practice on being leaner and stronger. I mean, I think those are the two things that, that really give you the most bang for your buck. And, um, you know, and, and, and I could say more muscular and stronger, but they, they kind of go hand in hand. But, and if you think about it, Getting, being lean helps you in almost every respect in life, right? So not in, ter- in terms of just health, but also in terms of performance. Now, the, even though I do a lot of powerlifting, one of the maybe exceptions to being leaner is that it probably does not help your maximum deadlift to squat or bench press. I mean, in fact, I'm going to be teaching a, a powerlifting clinic in Tucson next month, and one of the questions I'll ask everybody is, if you had to put 30 pounds on your bench press in the next 90 days, what would you start doing? And, and my answer to that question is I'd start eating. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, you know it's just you can't rely. So, so being leaner might not help you bench more or squat more or deadlift more, but it does help you in virtually everything else from keeping your joints healthy to being better at things like sprints and jumps and sports and pull-ups and dips and, you know, almost everything you can imagine. And, and, and again, not not to mention just being healthy and being able to uh, process carbohydrates uh, better without consequence and, and and all of that. So I think being leaner is a huge thing, and um, and then of course just being stronger. And and regardless of of what you're trying to do in life, getting stronger uh, sh- should be a priority. And I think if 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 you're not doing those two things in your training, you should really be rethinking your program. And um, I just bring that up because when I watch people in gyms, it almost seems like they're doing everything but getting leaner and stronger. I mean, they may think that they're doing that, but there's such a huge emphasis on kind of just tricks and fads and, like, you know, um, stability training and, you know, partner assistance and, and isometric work and just things that just really are, are kind of missing the mark in terms of developing muscle and improving your metabolism and getting stronger. And, and all, so, so this basically just comes back to doing kind of, I guess, what you would call kind of like old school weight training. Um, and so that might not sound all that exciting, but the results are exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that because, like you said, so many people are looking for, for novelty and, you know, check out this advanced body weight stunt that I can do, which – you know, yeah, there's going to be benefits to it, but if you don't have the basics down, you know, kind of the old school stuff like you're talking about, then all of that is, you know, you don't have the foundation that you need for, you know, basic health and functionality. And so, um, I think. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I get, I get the, I get the desire for novelty. Believe me, and you know, training properly is, is kind of a, a, an aesthetic pursuit. You know, it's kind of monastic in a certain way because if you look at. Um, if you look at the best athletes in almost any sport, you're just kind of doing your, your, the same old thing. I mean, if you go to the Olympic Training Center and you watch the weightlifters um, and you go one month, and then it's not like one month they're going to be using kettlebells and the next month they're using TRX and the next month they're using Pilates. And, like, 
they're just doing snatches and clean and jerks and squats and pulls like always. And it just it's it there is a grind involved in that. And um you know, that's that the ability to sort of forsake novelty is a discipline that's needed if if you want to master anything. So and I think about if you want to be a concert pianist, um, you're just kind of doing the same thing all the time. Uh, there, there might be subtle differences in, in the drills that you do from day to day, but you're not going to be playing the violin. You're not going to be playing the drums. Like you're just on that freaking piano all the time. And so um, I, I think I think I totally get the desire for, for novelty. I think it's a natural consequence of of what. Cal Newport would call deep work, um, but um, it's something that you have to um, kind of temper in yourself. Yeah, yeah, you're preaching to the choir, right? I couldn't agree more. Um, it's just, you know, but it's, it's not what people want to hear. You know, people want to hear that the new, improved, next best thing is going to be easier and faster um, when the truth, what they really need to hear, is that we've known how to do this stuff all along for a long time. And, yeah, we're getting a little bit I really agree. It. Yeah, you know, science is catching up with what the coaches have known for hundreds of years, and um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I think so, and, and I, 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 don't, I never really want to be labeled old school because I think I'm very new school. Like, I don't care if it's old or new. I just care about what works, and um, to be honest, if you want a better physique, I mean, you could just look at what bodybuilders have been doing for decades, and as you just mentioned, it, it has pretty much been figured out. Now, we are figuring out new uh, tricks and tips and nuances and, and, and little things that can help. And um, but but in essence, you know, I mean, I mean, if you think about it lately, there's been such a push for things like paleo and you know low carb and ketogenic diets and you know, all of those things may work fine, but, you know, the, the basic kind of high-protein, low-fat approach that bodybuilders have been doing for decades is kind of the approach that seems to work best if you want a better physique. And, you know, uh, it, it's not anti-science to look at people who are best at something and just kind of do what they're doing. As, as Tony Robbins has often said, success leaves clues. So I think you look at, you know, you know when people ask me, can I have a good body without lifting weights? And yeah, you can, but um, the best bodies in the world, almost without exception, are built with weights. So that seems like a good starting place. Yeah, yeah, and you go right to the source. If, if that's your goal, then model the people who have done it before you and then are the best at doing it. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, so my, my earliest memory of your work was um, an article on Teen Nation about EDT. So can you tell us about escalating density training and who would benefit uh, from using it? Yeah, I think that's like 14 years ago. That I think that first article I did at Teen Nation, um, I think it was in 2002, <laughs> to be honest. But, you know, so, so basically escalating density training is just a personification of a handful of principles that I think are, are useful for people to keep in mind. And, and another way I sometimes describe it is it's kind of the application of, of time management principles or productivity principles to, to training. And one of the, um, one of the um, things that, that is worth keeping in mind when it comes to developing muscle is that um, it, it's not what you do in a given set or a given exercise that, that really makes the difference. It's kind of myopic if you think of it that way. It's, it's just the total workload that you do. And so escalating density training was designed to enable you to do the most possible work in the shortest amount of time. And people sometimes mistake that for meaning that you're not going to really do a lot of work, and that's not really the case. It's just it's just a way of putting your, your training together in as efficient a way as possible. So the basically, to just kind of visualize this, you would take two either opposing or complementary exercises. There's a lot of ways to put this together, but this could be an upper body and a lower body exercise. For example, it could be deadlifts and pull-ups. But it could also be a pushing and a pulling movement. So it could be like bicep and tricep. There's a lot of ways to do this, but... 
you just want to pick two exercises that work entirely different muscle groups, ideally. And you will alternate back and forth between those two exercises. And your starting weight will be a weight that you could lift 10 times, but not 11. So what's called your 10 rep max. So during your warm-up set, you figure out what your 10 rep max is for both exercises. And then you're going to confine all of your work to a 15-minute period of time. Um, so um, you set the stopwatch, and you start your first set on your first exercise, and you don't do 10, even though you could. You do five, because we're not interested in how hard a given set is. We're interested in how much work you can complete over the whole set. And then you rest, and then you go to the second exercise, and you do a set of five. And the rest intervals are not prescribed. So you just basically rest as long as you need in order to get the next set done uh, successfully. And then you basically go back and forth doing sets of five until fatigue starts getting to the point where sets of five are getting really difficult. And then, and this is something that people don't realize about escalating density training for, for whatever reason, you then drop your reps to sets of four, and then as fatigue increases further, you might drop your reps reps to set to three and two and then one. And actually, by the time you get toward the end of that 15-minute time frame, um, sets of one um, feel about as hard <laughs> as sets of five did at the beginning. But in any event, when 15 minutes is over, you just basically you just chalk up the total number of reps that you perform. And the goal the next time you repeat that workout is just to do more reps in the same period of time with the same weight. So in other words, your work-to-rest ratio or your training density will increase. So we are sort of protecting the, um, the, the law of uh, progressive overload here, which really, that's kind of the whole ball of wax. I mean, people don't get stronger or more muscular by accident. You don't have to force the issue. And so um, I'm always very big on, on that. If you have a training method that doesn't in, in, invoke the, the, the law of progressive overload, you know, you might get a good workout, but I'm interested in training, not working out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long-term results, not just burning some calories. Yeah, yeah. EPT yeah. is, you know, it's a very, um, it's a very time-efficient. You know, I've I've used it for some cycles in the past, and it's a very time-efficient way to get a lot of work in. And um, kind of like as you alluded to, is by the end of a 15-minute training session of EDT, you know, not only have you done more volume than you would have done otherwise, but you usually have really cranked on the effort and the intensity, um, too, um, which is obviously... Yeah, and, and what, what's kind of interesting is, and by the way, an EDT workout could involve two or three of these 15-minute time frames, but when you think about a single 15-minute time frame, it really sounds like a little bit um, not serious. <laughs> it just, you know, if you're used to doing 90-minute workouts, but... There is something called Parkinson's Law, which states that um, work tends to expand to the time that you allot to it. So it is amazing if you force the issue how much work you can actually get done in 15 minutes. Um, but most people just never really kind of explore that because it kind of hurts a little bit. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can get a, a lot of work performed. There's no question. I mean, typically people will get anywhere between 50 and 70 total reps for two exercises in 15 minutes, and that's, if you, do, if you do 50 reps on two exercises, that's the equivalent, obviously, of doing five sets of 10 for two exercises in 15 minutes, and that's something that most people might take an hour to do. Yep. Yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of work crammed in there, and for, not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. <laughs> no, and, and the point should be made. Could you lift more weight for those sets and reps if you gave yourself more time? And the answer is yes, you totally could, and there's a time and a place to do that. But if you are time-starved and or if you are not used to this type of training, because, you know, an important factor in long-term training progress is, is novelty, but not the kind of novelty we were talking about before where you just do everything under the sun, but using different exercises, different methods, and if you are not used to what would be called, this is called metabolite training, you're, you're creating kind of uh, 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 metabolic waste as you do this type of training. If you don't have a history of, of doing this kind of work, um, you'll really benefit from it. And uh, so uh, it, it's, it's good for you, particularly if you're time-starved and or 
if you're just not used to this style of training. Right. Yeah, I, I see it as kind of one of those best things for your buck activities because, you know, you're going to build strength, you're going to build muscle, it's going to crank up your metabolism and help you burn fat, and you know, there's, there's a lot of benefit packed in. And so, you know, uh, very good for body composition in particular, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I know a lot of people who, you know, they say I'm too busy for a long workout, and it's like, well, there's really no excuses. You can get a lot of work done in a short time frame, and, you know, your standard EDT protocol is 15 minutes, but, you know, who's to say it couldn't be 10 minutes or 20 minutes? Or, that's right, that's right. There, there is a slightly arbitrary, people will often ask, why is it 15? Couldn't it be 20? Sure, it can be 20. Um, I, I kind of came up with 15 because then it, it, it struck me that you could do two 15-minute time frames plus warm-ups um, easily within an hour. In fact, you could get that all done probably within 45, 50 minutes if you, if you took it that way. So, yep, for sure. All right, so that's EDT. Um, do you, what, what are some of the other programming and periodization methods that you, you know, use most often um, apart from EDT stuff? Well, I mean, I think that, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a believer in, in what might be called block periodization these days, which is kind of just old style. You know, back again, we're revisiting this theme that this stuff has been figured out for a long time. So. You know, you, you you do a phase devoted to muscular hypertrophy, and that phase might last, you know, anywhere from four to six weeks. And, and during that phase, you're making you're making your engine bigger, so to speak. Um, you're, you're gaining muscle, and then you kind of flip the switch and you go to strength training for a period of four to six weeks. And now you teach that bigger muscle how to contract with more force, and so. That invokes this principle called phase potentiation, which just means that if, if you line up your training this way, that the strength training you do is, is made better, it's facilitated or potentiated by the hypertrophy phase that you did before it. So um, you will get a better total result that way than if you did these things independently. So uh, most people, I think, would be best off, and especially if you're talking to your primary audience of, of older guys, I think you're better off, you're best off kind of training uh, for a month like a bodybuilder and then training for a month like a powerlifter and just kind of going back and forth. Um, and I think that's the way most of us should probably train. Okay, yeah, great. All right, now um, this is a question I don't usually ask um, when I interview people, but you've, you know, you've been, you've been in this for almost 30 years, and so I wanted to ask you um, – what are some of your uh, biases when it comes to training? Yeah. And why, why do you have them? Uh, it's kind of a, a weird question. I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, but no, well, I mean, I think, I think the first thing, that it's important to realize that we all do have biases, mm -hmm. uh, either for or against. Um, and, and so, you know, we all value objectivity, but none of us are objective. And, and so that's the first kind of thing to, to realize. And, and so, I mean, obviously, as, as has already come out in the conversation, I'm very biased towards strength and, and, and muscle acquisition. So, I mean, so you haven't heard me talk about mobility. <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. this is a bias because I'm not good at mobility and, and, you know, I just don't really enjoy doing it. And it's something I probably should do more of. Um, I, I'm, I do pretty well. I mean, I can squat in parallel with a neutral spine. And I can, uh, you know, I can do an overhead press properly with, uh, w without pain. And so, you know, I, my posture is reasonably good. So I, I think I have enough mobility. But uh, I, I just think that, um, you know, if you look, when I think about my typical client who sounds a lot like one of your listeners um, and, and who looks a lot like me because <laughs> I'm one of those guys, I mean, I, I do think it's important to, um, maintain a certain minimal level of mobility and, and work capacity. But I think that can largely be done through resistance training if you're doing the right drills. So if you're doing full range RDLs and if you're doing overhead presses and if you are squatting and deadlifting with a neutral spine, um, you know, you are probably keeping yourself in reasonable shape in terms of mobility. Uh, now, of course, there are outliers, and there may be people who need more mobility than that. But, um, but I'm, I'm definitely biased towards strength and muscle acquisition. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're not pursuing those goals, um, I don't know. I mean, 
it's not for me to say what you should or shouldn't do, but when I think about, when I see a typical guy my age who is overweight and totally out of shape, he needs more muscle and needs to be stronger. Uh, that's not to say he doesn't have any other needs, but addressing those two concerns will take you the furthest in the shortest period of time, you know, in, in my opinion. So, so that's kind of my bias, and um, I've got nutritional biases as well, but uh, but in terms of training, that's that's clearly my bias. Mhm, mhm. Well, and, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense too because you know, as as we age, muscle mass just it begins to um, start to disappear all by itself, and so it becomes even more important to prioritize. Yeah, training and, and as I as I mentioned, like you don't gain muscle by accident. Like your body doesn't really want it there. It's metabolically expensive, so. Um, what we are all pursuing is not natural. And what's, what's kind of funny is, is that natural is the biggest buzzword in our industry, and it's the easiest way to sell a product, uh, you know, that relates to health or fitness. But what we are all pursuing is, is the opposite of natural. Um, you know, if you – I'm looking at my cat right now who's dead asleep on the couch, and if you want to know what natural is, just look at your pets. And what your pets do is they eat as much as humanly possible – and they move as little as possible, and that's what natural is. Um, but you know, if we do that, if we do that, there's consequences. So, um, uh, you know, I, I just always kind of laugh at the word natural. It just uh, makes no sense to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's, I think there's uh, definitely a lot of wisdom in uh, you know using strength exercises to also complement and build your mobility. You know, it's one of those things like you can. Um, so, like, something I'm involved with is called Move That. I'm not sure if you're familiar. It's kind of like parkour. Sure, um, sure. And it's it's just natural human movement, you know, learning how to run and climb and jump and, and balance and stuff. And, you know, one of the common teachings in Move That is that, you know, you get conditioning as a byproduct of practicing these skills. You know, yeah, don't yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be great for your legs and your core, and that makes sense. And so, you know, kind of in the same vein, doing a, a Romanian deadlift is going to be great for uh, your flexibility as well. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me, what you're saying. Um, so the next question is uh, about uh, gear. And so um, I'm wondering, do you think that people need a wide assortment of training gear to get fit or lean or strong? Or could most of us get by with a few well-chosen tools? And if so... Yeah. What would your recommendations be for outfitting a home gym? Because I've got a lot of – most of my readers are, are home fitness trainees, and they have minimal space yeah. or, you know, they just they want to get a lot out of their, their training gear. Well, so, you know, as you know, all fitness questions – the answer to all fitness questions starts with it depends. So I'm going to invoke that uh, – my Fifth Amendment right here. <laughs> it's like the 13th Amendment. I'm not sure which one it is. But, but um, you know, so – if you don't have much of a background, then you're not going to need a lot in the way of tools. But as I mentioned earlier, novelty is a big part of making continued progress. And it, it, the, the, the longer you've been training, the more important it is. And so, for example, I have been barbell bench pressing for like 35 years. Um, my body knows how to do it. it. That exercise never makes me sore because... It's just such a familiar experience that even if I go as heavy as possible, I just, you know, it just does not invoke that much of an adaptation response for me. Now, by bench pressing, I'm, I'm still maintaining bench pressing strength, but if I'm looking to build, pec, uh, you know, uh, mass in my pectoralis, bench pressing is not going to work because I just, you know, I've just been doing it for decades. And so, you know, and I've also been doing uh, – dumbbell bench pressing and incline dumbbell bench pressing. But if I had to make my pecs sore tomorrow for some reason and there was money riding on it, and I do think soreness is a reasonably good proxy for the damage that precedes hypertrophy. So I don't think you should – you shouldn't pursue soreness as a goal in itself, but it's a good proxy. So just so you know where I'm coming from in that. If I had to make my pecs sore tomorrow – and if you think about this question for yourself, you would do an exercise that you have either never done or have not done in a long time, something that's very unfamiliar, and 
you also would probably do it in a way that's very unfamiliar. So if, if so for me, that might mean like high rep uh, table crossovers, for example, which is something that I've maybe done four times in my whole life. And I, I hate doing high reps, and I don't tend to do a lot of high reps. So I would do high rep table crossovers, and, you know, and that would be the best way to make that happen. So the problem is, is that, um, yes, you, you can do a lot in a home gym, but um, more equipment is helpful if, if you can do it. So um, this, this, the answer to, to your question is kind of a spectrum. Yes, I mean, you can have just barbells and dumbbells and kettlebells and elastic tubing, and I think you can do just fine. But if you have access, and, you know, commercial gym memberships don't really cost too much. So, I mean, if you have access to a nearby gym, and you can get on machines and leg presses and hack squat machines and, you know, leg curl and things like that, uh, there's a lot of value in that as well. So it just kind of depends on your, your resources and, and how much you want to put into, uh, into that pursuit, I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Makes sense? Okay, so, oh, so you had home gym recommendations, so I, sh I should get to that. So, um, okay. Now, uh, now, of course, this depends on the style of training that, that you do. And, you know, obviously, if you're a kettlebell enthusiast, the answer is going to be a little bit different than if you're a power lifter or whatever. But, you know, my dream garage gym would be something that involves, you know, a, uh, a power rack that has uh, an attached chin-up bar and plate storage and, you know, a, a couple of good barbells and plates, including bumper plates, you know, rubberized bumper plates, and a wide assortment of dumbbells and kettlebells. And I would also like to have a back extension unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else am I missing? Maybe some elastic tubing and uh, maybe an ab wheel. And, uh, you know, you're off to a pretty good start just with that, and then you can kind of add on as things go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think they're all, those are all good recommendations. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, you know, there's, you'll have a uh, client who's, you know, middle-aged, overweight, you know, hasn't done any training recently, if ever, um, and what what they need is they need to get stronger to achieve their goals, um, you know, whether it's lose weight or get, get rid of those aches and pains. And so can you just, you know, talk a little bit about what happens to someone when they start lifting weights and how can somebody get started um, into weightlifting safely and effectively, you know, especially when they've got some wear and tear on their body? Yeah, well, maybe I'll take the second question first. Um, and, and the answer is to find a coach. And, um, and you know, on, on the one hand, it's better to have a, a, an in-person coach, but I've done a lot of online coaching with beginners who do really well. I've, I've got a guy right now in Belize who is um, in his early 60s who is brand new to lifting, who now is doing really nice looking deadlifts at 225 and, and doing really, really well. And all of his coaching is from me online. So, um, so you can, you can do really well even that way, but coaching is certainly, you want to, you want to find some kind of guidance. Now, uh, yes, you could do tons of research on YouTube and so forth and so on, but you know, coaching is the ideal scenario. But in terms of what happens, you know, as as you perform resistance training, and I'll stay away from the word weight because, to be honest, there are great ways to do resistance training through body weight drills and, you know, elastic tubing. There's all sorts of different ways to get this done. But, but regardless of how you do it, you know, muscles get bigger and stronger. And then, um, you know, there's kind of a, a cycle that perpetuates itself. Um, as you get bigger and stronger, your metabolism goes up, then, then you you get leaner, and when you get leaner, it's easier to move, so then you move more, meaning just your, your daily activity, you're more active just because it's easier to be more active, and then your metabolism increases more, and so forth and so on. It's kind of like a, it's a cycle that builds upon itself, and so I kind of think of, I, I kind of think of my physical life as a wheel, and it's either turning, and, well, it's turning forward or turning backwards, and, and, and you know, that cycle can build on itself in the wrong direction too, of course. As, as you 
if you're sedentary and you're eating more than you need and then you start getting weaker and you lose muscle and your metabolic rate goes down and you gain more weight and then you move less, which causes even more weight gain, which makes you more prone to injury, which makes you less prone to move. So, you know, one question to ask yourself is your, is your wheel moving forward or backward? And once, once you start doing the right things and you, you kind of get that wheel moving in the right direction, it kind of builds on itself and, and kind of, you know, anyone who's trained for a while can attest to this. There's kind of a momentum that takes over and things kind of get easier as you go. So um, you just set really a cascade of positive changes in motion. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and that's one of those things, like, I think when somebody experiences that for the first time, you know, it, 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 it's empowering, it's very exciting, and, and they want to tell the whole yeah. world about it. And, and that's why you see a lot of people who, you know, they get fit for the first time in their life or they complete some uh, tremendous and dramatic body transformation. They want to tell the world, and so they become a trainer or they start a blog because they see um, through experience what kind of, it's not just the physical transformation, it, it changes everything about your life and your attitude. And oh, your no question. And that's why that's not why we're all you know once you get hooked it's all over. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah. hard to see that at the very beginning sometimes. But you know, when I start with new like fat loss clients, one of the things I tell them is like you're not going to even believe where you're going to be in a year. Like you will make bigger changes than you could even conceive of. Um, it, it really can take you by surprise sometimes. Hmm. Yeah, I want to get back to uh, what you said a minute ago about finding a coach. I think that. You know, a lot of people hear that advice, and it's 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 the advice that people need to hear. And and you know, pretty much every professional I've ever talked to has stressed that that's really important. People need to do that um, when they're just getting started. But it's one of those things where they think, oh yeah, I should probably find a coach, but it's expensive, or I don't have time, or I don't want to commit to that. Um, but it, it's one of those things where if you don't do that, um, then you're left to your own devices and yeah, YouTube research or whatever. And you're figuring things out on your own that somebody has already figured out before you. And uh, yeah, it saves you. Sa- it saves you time and energy and money, to be honest. Um, right. You wouldn't think. Yeah, it really saves you a lot. And um, not only, not only is the purpose of coaching just to kind of uh, shortcut that process, but also it's really critical. I think any time you are in a process of self improvement. I think it's critical to have social support because just by definition, most people are not doing that. <laughs> you know, uh, so, for example, I'm in my late 50s. I don't, I don't know a lot of people my age deadlifting 500 pounds or who even care about things like that. Or, you know, so you've got to, you know, you're a minority of one, so to speak. So um, a coach can serve as that social support just so that you don't think you're the only person in the world doing these very difficult things. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of benefit. Yeah, yeah. And the, not to mention, you know, the results, obviously, you know, getting, you know, optimal results in a good time frame, but also being safe. And, you know, if you've got wear and, and, and you're on your body, yeah, you know, you don't want to mess around. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's talk some exercises now. What, what would you say are some of your go-to exercises that you think um, most people should be doing, um, but um, maybe they don't do or don't do as often as they should? Uh, that's a good question. Um, strangely enough, these are just the old standards. You know, I like to see people doing pull-ups and chin-ups, and the difference between those two is just hand position. Um, I like people squatting in some way, manner, or form, uh, deadlifting, uh, military presses, overhead barbell presses. Um, and, uh, you know, those kind of things. And, 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 and you know, things like lunging and step-ups and, and things like that. But, uh, and, and, you know, some kind of horizontal bench pressing. You know, there's basic movement patterns. There's horizontal pressing, which is like a push-up or a bench press. And there's overhead pressing, a ver- you know, vertical pressing. There's vertical pulling, which is like a, a pull-up. There's right. horizontal pulling, which is like a row. And then there's hip hinging, which is a deadlift, and so forth. So I think you want to represent all of those movement patterns in terms of your resistance training program. And you want those drills to be done on a stable surface. You don't want to be doing them standing on one foot or standing on a BOSU ball for the most part unless you're a physical therapy uh, patient, and, and if that's the case, then that's fine. You should be doing that. But, um, and there's a place for some arm work and things, but it's, 
as I watch personal trainers with weight loss clients in gyms, it's almost like they do everything but what I just mentioned. Um, everything is done on one leg or, you know, in a highly compromised position or you're on a BOSU ball or you're doing isometric, you know, you're doing like planks. And, like, again, this is perspective. Like, there's a place for planks, but you have to remember planks are isometric. Um, they're not very good for building muscle. They're not very good for building strength. They don't do much for your metabolism. You know, if you deadlift 375 for four sets of eight, that burns less than 100 calories. So if that's the case, you're burning a lot less than that doing planks. So I just, you know, again, there's a place, but, um, you know, and, and then you see, uh, you know, one of the things that, that just drives me insane is when I see trainers giving constant physical assistance to their clients on all their lifts. They're, you know, two sets of hands are on that bar at all times. So you have no idea what's being lifted. You can't apply progressive overload because in order to do that, you have to know how much you lifted today. And if two people are lifting the weight, you don't know how much of it you lifted. So those are the things that I think are kind of overdone in gyms. Yeah, well, I think I think you're right. You know, like we were talking earlier, you know, there's just so much novelty and nobody sticks to the basics. And so if we just do that, we get the bases covered and then we can specialize from there. Oh, okay, you want to specialize in this for this goal. We'll, we'll spend some time on that too. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think so. Um, so we, we've mentioned this. Um, I, I hear that you like to deadlift. And uh, I've seen a few videos of you deadlifting over 500 pounds um, in your 50s, which is very impressive. Um, Thank you. I'm just wondering, can we just, can we just talk about the deadlift a little bit? You know, who should deadlift? Because um, some people would say, you know, the deadlift is a really dangerous exercise and shouldn't be doing it. You know, what kind of training protocols, you know, should somebody follow? And, and yeah. I guess you have, like, some best practices when it comes to the deadlift, because clearly you, you've got this one figured out, at least uh, for yourself. Uh, I, well, I think, you know, uh, the, the deadlift is certainly a good lift for me. I, I think probably, maybe not all, but most people should be doing some form of pull or hip hinge or deadlift. That doesn't mean necessarily from the floor. It doesn't necessarily even mean with a standard barbell. But it's a movement pattern that should be trained on some level just because there's just so many benefits for it in terms of muscular development and strength and lifting mechanics and core stability, there's just so many benefits to doing the movement, not to mention the fact that you don't need much in the way of equipment to do it, which is always a plus as well. But, you know, whenever you're doing any type of loaded uh, movement, you want to have a neutral lumbar spine. So if you stand up and look at yourself sideways in the mirror right now, you see there's a normal curvature of your low back, and that, that should be preserved. So that means that Ideally, and this particularly applies to people who have existing low back issues, if you go to pick up something off the floor, you want to move from your hips and knees and ankles and not from your spine. Um, so deadlifting teaches you how to do that, and that's one of the real benefits of, of the movement. But there are people who, for various reasons, should not lift a barbell from the floor, either because of an existing injury or maybe they don't have the mobility to keep their low back neutral, so they might start with a barbell in a more elevated position to give them kind of a fighting chance on the movement. Or you might, um, you might use something that's called a trap bar or a hex bar, for example. Or, you know, favorite, you can, you, you can yeah, it's, it's a really good tool. And that's, by the way, that's one of the reasons why, like, joining a commercial gym can have a benefit, because you have all those little toys. Right. And, you know, you can lift heavy kettlebells in a sumo or like a, a wide stance kind of manner. But So I don't think everyone is really built to do heavy deadlifts off the floor, um, you know, with a, with a barbell. But it's certainly worth exploring on some way, manner, or form. And um, I don't know what the rest of your question was uh, on that. In terms of protocols, um, I don't know what I have to say about that other than you're going to be stronger on a deadlift if, it's, if you've trained it, um, you know, I don't do any other exercise where I lift over 500 pounds. So um, it requires more recovery than other movements. So generally speaking, it's trained less frequently than you would do like a bench press, for example. 
as a as a rule of thumb, the more weight you can lift on on a, on a movement, the more recovery it will require. So um, I deadlift twice a week, but um, one of those days is super light. Or I mean, it might not sound super light, but I was doing doubles with 315 the other day. It's my light day. So um, if if you're lifting over five, 315 is light. So um, so one of my days, one of my deadlift days is kind of an overload day, and the other is just kind of a light uh, practice day, so to speak. So um, uh, other people do very well just pulling once a week, but somewhere in that neighborhood is probably ideal for most people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And like you've been saying, you got to figure out what works for you and and get a coach so they can tell you what works for you. <laughs> yeah, particularly on something like a deadlift. But you know, boy, you just can't you just can't beat the benefits. Um, there's just so much to be said for core stability and grip strength. And, and by the way, if I have client, I have colleagues who refer clients to me sometimes. And uh, if somebody says, hey, I'm going to send this girl over to you and she deadlifts 300, I know a lot about that woman, you know. Mm-hmm. But if somebody says, okay, she squats X amount of weight, I still don't know anything because a squat can mean anything. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you ever watch people squat in gyms, uh, there's a wide variety of philosophies going on. So, uh, right. you know, it could be just a real shallow squat with, like, 10 people helping or, you know, who knows what. But if you right. can deadlift X amount of weight, uh, I now know something about you. Right. Yeah, there's, there's no getting around it. You either can pick that thing up or you can't. Um, so I hear you. Yep, yep. All right. So um, how about the, the Olympic lifts? Um, how do those fit into a training program, and who do you think should get into them? You know, these are obviously more technical exercise. Yeah. It could be argued that they're not necessary for body composition. So I just want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, well, they're certainly not. By, by the way, none of this stuff is necessary. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is helpful and useful and advisable, but nothing is necessary. So that's the first place to start. But I think mm-hmm. for most people, you know, doing – Lifting enough weight with Olympic lifts to make you stronger and more muscular requires a lot of skill. So um, that's the problem. Now, if if you happen to catch some weightlifting on YouTube and it's the first time you've seen it, and you or you you know you just run across it somehow, and you become intrigued by it and you want to try it, I'm all for that because I think that. I think the key with fitness is finding a sport or an activity or a method or a modality that kind of lights you up a little bit and has you intrigued and you kind of find compelling. And then that is your window into the fitness world. So it might not be what I might consider to be optimal, but if that gets you in the door, good things start happening. So, um, you know, and, and by the way, that might even be, like, I'm not real fond of jogging, for, for example, mm-hmm. but I have a, 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 an online client who, got in, who lost a ton of weight doing, um, like, these marathons and 100-mile races and everything else, and he loved it. And in the course of that, he started getting interested in nutrition. He started getting interested in strength training and mobility and physical therapy. And so that was his doorway into this world. And he found an activity that, although I think for strength and fat loss would not be my first choice, um, for whatever reason, uh, that has kind of really mobilized him, and it's something that he, he just dearly loves. He builds his whole life around it now. And so if, if weightlifting is that doorway for you, I think that's great. Because as a weightlifter, you're also going to do squats and deadlifts and probably bench presses, and you're going to learn about nutrition. You're going to learn about how to handle barbells. Now, with that being said, I think there are simpler lifts that you can do if you simply want better body composition and strength, but that's okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you find that boring. Maybe you want the challenge. And by the way, I compete in raw powerlifting, and I'm not horribly great at it, but I have good frustration tolerance. <laughs> I don't mind mm-hmm. doing things that are challenging, and that's okay, but if, if I found that raw powerlifting was souring me to training, I would find some other thing to do. Uh, for some people, it, it could be things like the move mat, or it could be, you know, people like swinging clubs, people like lifting kettlebells. I think all of it is good. Um, you know, there, there's, there's 
there's optimal versus real, and I think that um, uh, people are kind of drawn toward different activities, and I try not to be dogmatic, and just because it's not my favorite thing personally um, doesn't mean it can't be beneficial to somebody. Right, right. I forget who said it, but um, there was that quote, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day of your life. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's it. And so like, I really encourage older adults to get involved in some kind of a sport. Um, and there are master's categories in almost all sports from track and field to swimming to judo to jiu-jitsu to, you know, everything you can imagine. And so maybe you start – taking interest in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, and so um, mm -hmm. through the course of that, you start learning about mobility and about strength and how to eat right, and, you know, it's all good. Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, you, you mentioned um, earlier a little bit that, you know, you're, you're a healthy guy, you've had some, you know, minor injuries here and there. I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, injury prevention. Do you have any advice um, on that topic? Yeah, I think probably I have at least two things to say on that, and, and one of them is not terribly novel, <laughs> which is just don't do stuff that hurts. Um, and I just, you know, it's the most obvious thing, but most stuff heals if you just give it a rest. And I've got a little bit of a dinged-up shoulder right now, and I keep bench pressing hard twice a week. And I'm kind of like it's not stopping me. I can still bench press hard twice a week, but it's not getting better either. So I'm very close to being uh, on the verge of just giving that a rest a little bit because it's just kind of it kind of hurts during my warm-ups, but once I'm into my work set, it feels okay. Um, so you don't. I and, and by the way, I don't necessarily practice all of my best advice, and, and you know because I'm human too. But uh, you know, so do as I say, not as I do necessarily. But but although I'm just kind of joking around a little bit, in general, if something's really hurting me, I just stop. So so don't do things that hurt. And the second point is kind of related to this, which is that, you know, not everybody is built to do all types of movements. Um, so, for example, if you are a heavy set guy in your 50s with horrible flexibility, you might not want to pursue Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. You follow? Or, for that matter, oh, yeah. you might not want to pursue distance running either. I, you know, but... but uh, you know, so not everyone can do powerlifting. Not everybody can squat to parallel and with a neutral spine in a safe position, but a lot of people can. So um, there are – and what's kind of nice about bodybuilding as, as a general philosophy is that it's not, it's not absolutely tied to any specific exercise or philosophy, so it allows you to find things that work for you. But don't do sports or activities or exercises – that just don't work for your body type, I think that's really, really key. And you, you might not know what those things are right now, but, you know, with a good coach, you can figure out what that is. But, you know, it depends on your personal anatomy and your injury history and your proportions and, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, so, yeah. Perfect. All right, so here's, here's kind of an interesting question. What are some things that you do differently now than you used to or maybe something you changed your mind about um, over the years? Because I know, oh, I mean, even yeah. in, I mean, I've only been in fitness as a career the last, you know, 10 years, but I've, I've changed my mind on stuff. And so, yeah, and that's, that's a good thing. I mean, it, it, it's, um, I always say, you know, people talk about having an open mind. I would categorize it as I want to have an active mind. Um, and that allows you to change your position on things, and that just shows that you're learning. But well, I'll just give you my, my, the biggest difference between my approach now and maybe 15 years ago is I'm much more comfortable with the idea of using machines in, in your training than I used to be. And it's funny how human bias works, but uh, uh, back 20 years ago, I used to have kind of this hardcore mentality, and I had kind of a personal aesthetic, which means that you should learn how to do free weights and uh, wh why are you doing Smith machine squats? You should learn how to, you know, you should learn how to do barbell squats and, and so forth and so on. And, yes, I still think you should learn how to do barbell squats. But um, there, and, and, and as, I, as I would make this argument, I would always point out the downside of machines. And, 
and I'll, I'll freely admit this, but this is how people, this is how the, the human mind works. I would point out the downside of machines, which is that the machine restricts you to a fixed movement pattern, and therefore there's no skill involved, and, you know, skill is part of strength acquisition, so forth and so on. And you know what? That's true, but there are a lot of benefits of machines. <laughs> it's just it's funny how it's just funny how it works like people uh, uh, are you familiar with the guy he, he wrote a book called uh um a moral case for fossil fuels his name is alex epstein i uh, know i haven't heard of that uh, okay don't don't feel bad <laughs> that's kind of an obscure thing to bring into the conversation but anyway he is an advocate of fossil fuel uh uh you know development and, and use and and one of the things he says is that when people, when, when people are against fossil fuels, they only talk about the downside, which is that maybe it's warming up the climate or there's this or that. Or they never talk about the benefits. And, and fossil fuels are responsible for our entire Western civilization. Um, yeah. so, so all he's saying is when you're going to debate the value of fossil fuels, like let's talk about the pros and the cons, not just the cons, mm -hmm. which I think anyone can agree with. So. So I would just talk about the, the cons of, of machines, which is that they restrict you to a fixed pattern. But you know what? That's not that much of a drawback, given all the, all the benefits. So and I'll, I'll give you an example. I can, I'm a, I can squat a lot of weight. Um, in the past few months, I've done 400 pounds for one rep. So that's a pretty good squat. But if you look at how I squat, uh, I've had some serious knee surgery, and so I have a very sort of hip-dominant squat. I lean forward quite a bit. So that's unsafe for me because I can still maintain a neutral spine, but squats are, are totally ineffective for quad development for me because of my position. So um, there is no reason why I shouldn't get on a Smith machine or on a hack squat machine or on a leg press, and I do use those things, so that I can get some training stimulus to my quads because the squat just is not going to do that for me. That's just an example of the value that, that weight training machines can have. Um, so I think it's important to resist the urge to be dogmatic because um, everything has pros and cons, and so it's just a matter of sort of assessing the, the ups and the downs of, of every approach you use, and it's just kind of a, a, a cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, yeah, and even now as you're saying that, I, I can realize that I've kind of done the same thing over over my career of, you know, it, for a while it was, you know, yeah, free weights are better than machines, and and it's kind of the same thing, like, yeah, you know, machines are good for physical therapy or for, you know, older people um, or, you know, something like that, which is kind of nice. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, right. and the thing about it is there, there are a lot of humongous bodybuilders out there who have quads that you and I wish we had who built those quads pretty much on, like, leg presses and hack squats. Yeah. You know? Yep. So what's wrong with that? Right. Yeah, so I think we, you're yeah. right. We gotta we gotta look at the the overall picture, the pros and the cons, and the risk and the benefits, and and make make those decisions. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is no kind question. of been a theme um, of uh, you know uh, older trainees. Um, so I've got a, a bunch of uh, older men, mostly in their fifties and sixties, on this new uh, newsletter list. Um, and so I was just wondering, do you have any you know general advice for older athletes or fitness enthusiasts or anyone who wants to make you know the kind of the strength and the fitness um, lifestyle a you know a, a lifelong pursuit? You know, something that you know, I'm going to be doing this for the next 20, 30, 40 years or uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to revisit a few things I, I just mentioned, and then I'll, I'll, I'll add a couple of new ones. But, you know, again, don't do stuff that hurts. Uh, pain is a sign that something is wrong. Um, it's not a good thing, so don't do stuff that hurts. Find activities that work well for you, sports or activities or exercises. Um, but another – I happen, I'm actually writing a book right now. I'm about three-quarters of the way through with it um, on, on, on sort of older men's fitness. Um, because it's kind of near and dear, because I'm one of those guys myself now, so and I'm doing pretty well at it. So I think I have a few things that are that are valuable to share. So one of the things is that it's important to reconcile needs and wants. And here's what I mean by that: we all we all have activities 
that, that we are good at and we take pride in and that give us a sense of significance. I don't know what it is for you, but one of the things it is for me is that it's fairly noteworthy that at 193 pounds I can deadlift 510 at age 57. Um, it's pretty close to a world record in, in some powerlifting federations. So I take pride in that. And, and it, it's, good, it's good to do those things that you take pride in and give you a sense of significance or, you know, uh, if you want to call it, you know, you're, you're badass or whatever it is, you know, that's a good thing. However, you also have things that, that you should do that are less fun and don't make you feel quite so special, <laughs> which might be things like mobility work or, you know, bringing up your non-existent existent calves or who knows what it is or, or getting lean or whatever. So, so the point of it is is that you have to find a way to reconcile those two things. And one of the examples I give is that, well, I'll give you an example in my own history. As I mentioned before, I really sort of disliked jogging. And I, I think, you know, okay, maybe it has a place, but people have, people invest far too much of their hopes and dreams when, into jogging when it comes to fitness transformation. I mean, it's just not really the mainstay activity that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. So, and um, I'm actually... I, I actually said something in a Teen Nation article one time that I'm famous for, and, and I'll just say it because it's funny, but I, I don't mean it literally. It's just to wake people up and get attention. But I said that uh, uh, jogging is probably the most effective non-surgical form of gender reassignment. Uh, <laughs> and one, all I meant by that is that if you do a lot of jogging, you will get weaker, you will lose muscle, you will lose power and strength, and those are, that's all a loss of masculinity. So that's, that's all I meant by that. Now, that being said, if you love, if you you love jogging. Keep in mind here, you got to keep in mind you're writing to the Teen Nation audience. Which is, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but now, look, jogging is fine if you're also doing other things and you like it and you're decent at it. And like, it's okay. But, but that should not be the holy grail of fitness activities if, if you're looking to be uh, healthy and, and lean and strong. But that being said, and here's where I'm going with this. About a year ago, I started, I don't know how this got into my head, but I'm like, I wonder how long it would take me to run a mile. <laughs> because I just like have never, one time when I was in my 20s, I ran six miles and it almost ended my life. And it was the most horrifying thing. I'm like, I'm just terrible at it. I hate it, um, you know. And, uh, but at the same time, you know, if you, if you are 25 years old and it takes you 20 minutes to run a mile, that's unacceptable. Yeah. But at age 25, you could fix that. But if it takes you 20 minutes to run a mile when you're 55, you may never get that back. And so I'm not saying that everybody needs to have a high level of cardio, cardiovascular ability, but you should maintain some semblance of these motor qualities that maybe you don't have the greatest enthusiasm for, like mobility and, and cardiovascular endurance. So I decided to run a mile. And actually, I waited till nighttime so that nobody would see, just in case it was really uh, horrifying. <laughs> and uh, so I, I ran a mile, and it ended up I did it in like 11 minutes and 45 seconds, which mm -hmm. if you're actually like a real runner, that's not too impressive. But if you give the fact that I weighed 200 pounds and I had never done it, and, you know, it's actually okay. So to me, that was a sign that, well, I guess, I guess I'm all right. You know, I, 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 can, I can run on my own in a halfway reasonable time, and I'll kind of keep tabs on that. Had it been 20 minutes, I think I would start doing some running. Yeah. Because yeah. My, my, my theory kind of is, is that it, it's kind of easy to be strong when you're in your 50s. That's probably the easiest fitness characteristic to maintain. But mobility and aerobic endurance are, are kind of different animals. So my philosophy is kind of that um, regardless of what your primary interest is, you should maintain reasonably all around fitness as you get older because if you lose those characteristics, these things aren't hard to maintain once they're already developed, but if you lose them, um, you know, they're, they're hard to get those things back. Yeah, yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense to me, and, and I agree. I think we should all have a basic level, or at least I think um, – People who are training for fitness for life, you know, if you're not an extremely specialized athlete like a competitive powerlifter or something, 
if you're in this for the long haul, it makes sense to maintain a basic level of competency and strength and endurance activities and, you know, different movement skills. You know, like if you can do 20 mm -hmm. pull-ups but you can't climb on top of a tree branch, you know, yeah. there's, a, there's a deficiency there. And so... Yeah, and you, you have to you have to make that call for yourself. Like, what is acceptable and what what's not acceptable? I can't really tell you what the answer is to that. But right. um, I don't know. Like this morning, I was walking across the street, and a car was coming that I didn't know, and I had to kind of sprint like several steps across the street. I want to make sure I can do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I I want to make sure it should not be a struggle at age 55 to get up off of the floor. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's. And, and, and by the way, it's not a struggle for me, but if I'm being honest, it's not as easy as it was when I was 25. There, there is a difference. So this sounds kind of quirky, but if you're an older guy or an older woman listening to this and you find any challenge at all getting up and down off the floor, um, that should probably be part of your training. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah, and I, I've had a lot of people um, – it contacted me and sent me questions like, do you have any, like, standards or something that I could strive to? Because we all like a goal, and we like a performance goal. Yeah. And so I've been, I mean, I, I don't know, if this is just off the top of my head, but I've been trying to turn around ideas in my mind, like, you know, what what are all the different things I would include in that? I mean, yeah, there's to be some obvious strength standards and some probably basic endurance standards, but um, I don't know, maybe that's an idea for your book. I'd love to, uh, I'm definitely going to be picking up a copy. Yeah, I'm definitely, I'm definitely working on standards, and uh, boy, it, that's a very tough thing because it is subjective. Yeah. Um, and now, now, my standards for myself are, are the things that I can do now. So I'm, even though I'm hitting PRs in my list and stuff, um, n new PRs are kind of far, in, in, far between for me. So um, maybe I'm sort of at that point where I'm kind of plateauing. Um, and so it may be that the training I'm doing right now really is mostly to maintain my current status rather than to gain. But um, that's okay because, you know, if I look at myself now at 57, if I have my current physique and strength levels when I'm 67, I'll be thrilled. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's okay. So, you know, on any given day I can do 10 pull-ups. Um, last year I did 17. I was kind of working toward that. But so if on any given day I can only do eight pull-ups, then the alarm bells start going off. I'm like, all right, got to get after this. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, time to make that a focus. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so um, another question that I, that I have, I like, to, I, I like to kind of figure out, you know, for, for people who have been successful at this for a long time, have been healthy, have been fit, I want to try and figure out kind of what drives you and what motivates you. So how have you managed to stay consistent with your training for so long? Is it passion or a sense of purpose? You just love your sport. What motivates you? What, what gets you up in the morning and gets you to work? That's such a good question. I think that's a good thing to be on top of for anybody because if, if you can understand what drives you, then you can kind of optimize your environment to kind of facilitate that. So... Um, so right now I'm hoping real quick I can be articulate about this. <laughs> mm. First of all, I have a certain amount of personal pride. And pride is, is that one of the seven sins? I'm not really sure. But, but it doesn't sound like a positive trait when, when you just say it offhandedly. But I have a certain amount of pride in my physical capabilities. And that's what got me into training in the first place. Um, my father in particular I think of, he was, my father was older when I was born. He was 48 when I was born. And he was kind of like an old, slow 48. So, like, when I was 12, he was 60. And it's amazing when I think about that now, because I'll be 60 in a few years. But my father struck me. Now, maybe part of this was just my own perception. But my father struck me as exceedingly frail and slow when he was 60. And I remember just thinking, I am just never going to be that guy. Um, and and I, that was kind of a something that was run, running you know, subconsciously for me, I think, throughout my life. And I just value having physical capabilities. So I think for me, it's just having pride in that. And, and um, um, it's just important to me. And I'm not sure really where that came from. But I, I guess I had negative examples in my own life that you know, of people who, who did not have good physical capability. Um, and so I, I think maybe it's important to latch on to 
whatever it is that drives you, right? So, mm-hmm. um, no, like, I, like I, I see, really like, th- this is how I am, and I'm not saying this because this is an appealing characteristic necessarily, but I'll just reveal something about myself. When I see people who pull up into a handicapped parking spot and get out of the car and they appear to be fine, okay, I, I realize they may actually have some kind of a handicap, but what goes through my head is I will be damned if I ever have a handicapped, whatever it is, a sticker, like, you know, I just, if I lost a leg, I wouldn't do that. Like, I just have pride in my own physical capacity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the way, I think you're one of those people, I'm not criticizing you, like, I, that's not my point in saying this, but I'm just saying right, that, right. like, I don't know, I just have pride in my physical capabilities. Yeah, and I think that it's good that you, you kind of latched on to that idea and used, um, you know, your father just as an example of, you know, I, I don't want that to be me um, when I'm his age, and so I'm going to take steps to do it. Uh, because I think too many times people learn that lesson too late. They don't realize how good they've got it until they've lost their health and their fitness, and then all of a sudden it, it's a huge priority and, and everything changes. So it's good to figure this out. Yeah, I think a lot of people are driven that way, right? I mean, uh, some of the most successful people financially I know, uh, the wealthiest people I know, most of those people grew up poor. And so when they were growing up, what was going through their head, obviously, was, well, that's not going to be me. So I think I think I have that same kind of experience on the physical realm, uh, just personally. Yeah. But for other people, it might be that you want to be in good health when you're in your 60s and 70s and 80s to enjoy your kids and your grandkids or like, there's no wrong or right to this. It's just a matter of, of finding that thing that animates you. Exactly, exactly. All right, I got a few more questions for you. I know we're, like you said, uh, 90 minutes top, so I'll, I'll make sure we're done before then. But uh, uh, we're we'll, we'll, we'll fine. Okay. Um, so what is something that you wish you knew about training um, when you were younger and still getting started? Um, I always like to ask this question because I get, I get you know, just good insight um, out of it usually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually have a very quick answer for that. Is I, I just wish I understood the the process of developing hypertrophy or, or gaining muscle. Like I just have such a better understanding of that now than I did. I'm not. I, I'd be remiss to ever say that I'm, I've mastered anything because whenever I say that ten years later, I realize how much more I know then. But um, but yeah, I just really did not understand the the, the process of developing muscular growth. And so through most of my career, I was mostly interested in strength, and which is probably why I'm reasonably strong now. But a typical workout for me would be, you know, maybe I would work up to a heavy set of one or two or three, or maybe I'd do three sets of three or three sets of two. I would do something in that neighborhood. And then maybe if I thought I could break a PR, maybe I would lighten up the weight and do a back off set of 10 or maybe once, you know, but maybe not. And so... Basically, that's not, it, especially if you're experienced, that's not the best way to, to build muscle. You really need more volume. You, you really, and, and today, I do things like it's not uncommon for me in a hypertrophy phase to do four or five or six sets of eight to ten reps, you know, all hard sets. That's the kind of volume you need to really develop muscle. And I wish I had done that when I was younger because, you know, I've got a good physique and I'm, I'm you know, certainly built better than 99% of my peers. But, you know, I'm 195 pounds at six foot two, and, you know, in clothes I just look kind of skinny, and uh, I wouldn't mind at all weighing like 240 or something and lean. And <laughs> but, you know, these things must be done when you're young for the most part, and uh, I just did not understand that process when I was younger. And, you know, muscle is kind of like money in the bank. Once you have it, it's not hard to maintain it, and it's not hard to lose it either. But, but um um, if, if, if you want to carry a lot of muscle, that's a young person's game, and you've got to do that while you're, while you're still young. So, uh, yeah, I wish I had a better handle on that when I was younger. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, now who are, who are some of the other fitness and strength and conditioning professionals that you look up to? Do you have anyone who has, you know, influenced you quite oh, a bit boy. over the years? So many people, so many people. Well, what's, what's, what's fortunate for me is that being in the industry and having a, a fairly prominent position in the industry, I've come to know and, and make friends with a lot of these people. I mentioned Dr. Fred Hatfield earlier. He was one, one of my really early mentors. But, boy, there's just so many people that 
this is dangerous because I'm going to leave people out. There's just so many people, but just off the cuff, um, Brett Contreras, uh, Dan John, uh, Pavel Sassoline, uh There's some new guys coming up. I, I don't mean to use the word new, but coming into prominence now, guys like uh, Mike Israetel and Greg Knuckles. And, um, uh, you know, then there's people like, uh, you know, uh, Christian Thibodeau and Eric Cressy and Mike Boyle and uh, uh, Greg Cook. And, uh, boy, there's just so many people. Um, John Russin and Joel Seidman is doing very interesting work out there right now. And these are all kind of strength and muscle guys for the most part. But uh, Chad, uh, Chad Wesley Smith is a very impressive, interesting guy. And there's a weightlifting coach who works with him. His name is Max Aida. Um, very, very, very sharp characters. And, uh, you know, uh, Tony Gentlecore, uh, very impressive stuff that he's doing. Um, so many people out there. Um, I'm missing a million of them w- without question. But we live in a great time. I just I remember early in my career, you know, there was no Internet. There was no YouTube. There was, there was no Google. And uh, it was a chore to, to kind of come up with this information. And there's so many impressive people out there now. And it's just so great that, that you can get your hands on all this information. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a couple of names I didn't recognize. that I'm going to have to look them up and subscribe to whatever they're doing. Um, I mean, there's 20, 30, 40 people I missed in that quick accounting, but yeah, there's there's so many people out there. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, one more training question. Uh, what's some of the best advice you've ever received about training? Interesting. Huh. Boy, I might be slightly stumped on that. Um, <laughs> the best advice. Well, I mean, I, I've learned from so many people and. Um, sometimes the things that I've learned didn't necessarily come in terms of advice, but um, I would say I'll, I'll just give you an example of some, something that may not qualify literally as advice, but something that just made a big impact on me. When I was in my 30s, and I'm prone to picking up new sports that I had previously never done, um, I started throwing the discus. And I had never been in a track meet in my entire life I'd never touched a discus until I was 32 years old. And before you know it, I'm, like, throwing in Masters Nationals and, you know, completely crazy. But I'm did super have, passionate. Can I, can What's I that? In, did, did this have anything to do with Dan John? Can I just ask that? <laughs> a little bit. Dan John will enter into the story in just a moment here. Okay. So, so I forgot when and where I met Dan John. But, uh, so I do some throwing sessions with Dan John, who, who was quite amazing. And uh, actually, the most, the most, uh, the winningest master thrower of all time. Like, for quite some time, he was ranked number one in all throwing disciplines, like hammer, discus, shot put, and javelin. Uh, completely amazing. Um, but in any event, John hooks me up with a guy by the name of John Powell, who is an Olympian in the discus, and I think a world record holder as well. Hmm. And. Um, and uh, so I go out, this is in Las Vegas, I go to John's house to, to throw with some guys. Why they wanted me out there, like, I, I'll never know. He's literally training guys that are on the Olympic team, and here I walk up, I'm like 35 years old, don't know what I'm doing. But uh, they're out there in the desert, and they're throwing, they just have a piece of plywood in the desert, <laughs> and it's like all tippy and everything, and, you know, you throw, the de- you throw the disc, and, like, the only way you know where it is is there's like a puff of, like, sand, like, where they threw it, and, you're dodging, you know, rattlesnakes and stuff, and it's completely crazy. But they were very, very focused on hitting PRs of any kind. And um, and if they couldn't hit a PR in a standard discus, though, then they would then they would have a contest with one of the drills, like what's called a South African or a standing throw. Or if 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 nobody could improve upon their best, and they literally would make up some kind of crazy drill, like throwing blindfolded or throwing backwards with the wrong hand or whatever. It's just hilarious. But basically, they would come up with some way to say that, okay, I did a better throw today than I've ever done in my life. And they, they would have money on it. Like John would have, like, okay, first person over 200 gets 50 bucks, and, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so – there was just a real dedicated passion toward improving upon your best. And I think 
that really had a huge influence on me, and it really taught me the importance of progressive overload. And um, what's nice, of course, about track and field and lifting is that they are not subjective activities. Uh, the, the first time you ever throw 200, you've never done it before, you're clearly better than you ever were. You know, the first time you deadlift 300 or 400 or 500 pounds, you're clearly better than you ever were. And so um, I don't know if that kind of uh, fulfills uh, <laughs> the question that you asked. But uh, oh, yeah, no, I, I, don't know if, I, mean, I don't know if I've ever had much in the way of advice, but I, I, I'm observant, and there have been many instances over my life where I will hear somebody make a comment or kind of state an approach that they have that, that kind of makes a mark on me. But, um, you know, tracking and documenting your progress and always be seeking uh, personal records is huge. I mean, that's, that's self-motivational, and it's just intrinsic proof that, that you're improving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, that's, I think that's a great, great answer to that question and, and a great way to, uh, to wrap up the interview. So the last question I have for you is uh, where's the best place for anybody who's listening to this to find more information about you and, and Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm all over social media. I'm very easy to find, and, and you can find me. Um, like, I'm, I'm very active on Facebook, and I have a personal and a business page. The personal page is just Charles Staley. And uh, the, the, the coaching page is uh, the Staley Strategies. Uh, but I also have a blog. Uh, I have a post that comes out every Wednesday at uh, TargetFocusFitness.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can also find me on uh, Instagram and Twitter and all those kind of things. So, yeah, I should be pretty easy to find for the most part. I write for TeenHM and Bodybuilding.com. And, uh, yeah, so I'm all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll make sure to put some links below um, where I post this interview, so it's easy to find you. Um, so, Charles, awesome. hey, thank you, thank you very much for taking almost an hour and a half out of your time to uh, do this. Interview. Oh, my I pleasure. Had a great time. And uh, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad you reached out to me, and uh, that was fun.